go ahead and open up now to James chapter 2, if you haven't already done so. And uh, by way of review, let's kind of get into uh, maybe some random trivia real quick, man. Who's, who are we talking about here? What's this epistle all about so far? Who's, who's our author? Who's our author? Who are we talking about? Or who is our author and who are we talking about? And what are we talking about? What do you guys got for us? James, the brother of Christ. Good, James, the right? The half-brother of Jesus himself. Uh, Paul, remember, calls him a pillar in the, in the early church. He was a pillar in that church in Jerusalem, in the early church, and a leader of the church at that time. And um, so we went through that and talked about that a little bit in the introduction. Uh, it may be... Uh, depending on timeline, James could be uh, and is believed to be perhaps the earliest writing of the New Testament. So it could be the first epistle written in the New Testament. Um, but anyways, if you want more info on that, you can go back to the introduction from a, a, a few few weeks back when we started. Uh, but as we got into chapters 1, we've gotten into chapter 2 last week. Uh, what are some of the things, what are some of the take on? What's some of the stuff we're talking about? Um, remember that Favoritism. You, sorry, go ahead. Who's that, Jim? Yeah, favoritism or you know, respect a person or no respect or. Okay, good. Yeah, that was uh, last week, chapter two, right? So James is a different kind of epistle in the sense of it's not like Paul's letters where uh, he writes, you know, specific instruction to a specific church um, or churches in a in a certain region or a specific church or people at a specific church. It's more of a general letter uh, with a lot of application. Uh, to us certainly today and so uh, there's going to be several teachings um, that I've kind of told you that are kind of linked all together with these little one-liners and uh, and so some of it he starts off in, in chapter one talking about remember count it all joy when you meet various trials uh, that you will have trials or tribulations and difficulties in, in your life and that is testing right the testing of your faith um, but how that is different from being tempted as remember then he goes to talk on about uh, let no one think that God is the one tempting you, uh, that God does not uh, tempt people, uh, but each person is tempted when he's lured and enticed by his own lust, right, and gives into that. And so we understand that there is the tempter, right, or the deceiver, the liar, right, but the, the evil one, the wicked one, Satan, uh, out there. But we also understand that our flesh is wicked and evil and fallen. So we also understand that we have our own wicked thoughts and wicked desires and, and stuff that we lure ourselves into and, and get overtaken by that. Okay, so there's a difference there, right, in, in testing and tempting. And so um, the testing is something that God is, is definitely doing in us through the situations that, that are happening in our lives as he's testing our faith and he's growing us uh, through those things, right, growing us in perseverance and growing our faith uh, to be more like Christ in those situations. But he's certainly not tempting us in order to cause us to sin uh, or to go in the other direction, right? That is not his uh, intention. So then Jim brings up uh, what we got into a little bit last week, going into chapter 2. As we look at the end of chapter 1, you see, uh, look at verse 19. We see, be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger, right? As he says, to be not just hearers of the word, but doers of the word. And so somebody tell us maybe uh, what is the difference in that and how do we become one or the other and, and can we become one or the other? How does that all work? Can you be a hearer of the word and not a doer of the word? Sure. Sure, right? So then what marks the difference? What's, uh, you know, what is it that we're supposed to understand about that? Action. Remember, he gives us the analogy of the mirror and looking in the mirror and then you leave and you forget what it looks like. And we talked about even the, the parable of the um, sower and casting the seeds, you know, and the seed falls upon the ground and is taken away. Uh, and so you kind of leave the mirror and you, you, you forget what you even saw. Um, you know, and so this analogy that he gives is talking about um, not remembering and walk away and it doesn't really take place. And so that would be a, just a strictly a hearer of the word, um, could be someone who hears it, but it doesn't transform them, right? It doesn't change them. Uh, they're not saved uh, by, by hearing of the word because the Holy Spirit hasn't effectually called them to, to, to salvation in that moment. 
but for those who, who the Spirit does call and awakens by hearing of the word, then they should be doers, correct? So that the true hearers and the ones who are actually transformed are the doers of the word. And so we're going to continue to see that thought process unpacked uh, through the book of James, and we'll look at that a little bit even tonight, you know, seeing the difference on that and what that means. So then we got into chapter 2 last week, and that's what uh, Jim was talking about a little bit about partiality, right? We've talked about uh, partiality, um, you know, or favoritism, right, and, uh, and versus love or favoritism and love. And remember, he gives that, um, that picture of um, the rich man coming in and the poor man being in there, and you show favor to the rich man, and you don't show any, any love or kindness to the poor man. And so in that, what's the overarching principle? That, that, uh, that we talked about last week. What will be the difference there? Because we talked about last week how we do judge, right, and that we are to judge those brothers and sisters, and that God will judge those outside the church. Uh, but so then what does this exactly mean as far as this, this kind of partiality or this kind of uh, favoritism? What, what is this based on, uh, and, and what's, the, what's the proper thought of it? Favoritism are looking for what they can, what they can get out of it. Okay. You know, favor somebody if, if if it benefits them. Good. Sure. It's also the outside appearance, you know, the, or, or it's all about the heart. It's not about the outside. Appearance. Right on. That's exactly where we'll be unpacking more tonight. Um, yeah, because. You shouldn't be partial or showing favoritism based on external factors, right? Um, or external circumstances or whatever the case may be. Because this man's rich, we show him favor over the guy who is poor. Uh, because why? What's the, what's the basic principle? When we just talked about the effectual call of the Holy Spirit being a, a hearer of the word and doer of the word. How do you know which of those two are going to be saved? Sure, both of them may be. Sure, neither of them may be. But do you do you know that? I don't know that, right? As Adam talked about, we don't know their heart, and we don't know who the Spirit has called unto salvation, right? So you are not to, to show partiality in that way, because how do you know that the one you're neglecting, the poor man in this analogy, right, is not the one who is going to be your brother in Christ? And yet the rich man, as he talks about, are the ones taking you and dragging you to courts and persecuting you and doing all these things against you. So why would you show favoritism to him when you could be neglecting this man over here who might be your brother? Um, so good, not to show partiality, in, uh, certainly in external factors. Okay. Good, so we left off last week um, in verse 13. So let's go ahead and, and pick up, unless anybody have any other thoughts, comments, input on, on review of uh, the first chapter and a half? A lot about partiality is because people, and I'm one of them, want something out of it. It's, it, it's kind of a, the, the wickedness is that you, you want to be super nice to someone and you can get something back. And it's, sure. It's kind of like a trap, you know, that you can be pulled into. Um, you scratch my back, I scratch yours. Yeah, it really kind of... Yeah. I almost feel myself being pulled into that sometimes. You know, so it's, yeah. Sure. Sure. I think if we're honest, all of us have struggles with that, you know? Good. Okay, well, let's get into uh, verse 14. And uh, who can read for us here tonight? Let's go verse 14 uh, right through the end, 14 to 26. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for their body, what good is that? So also by faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith. And I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? 
Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture has fulfilled that, says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. Hmm. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? Whereas the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you so much, God, for this night. Again, thank you for this time. Thank you for this group. Thank you for this text. Thank you for your word and uh, how you continue to, to mold us and shape us through it. And, uh, God, we certainly ask that you would uh, teach us and, and allow us to uh, be receptive of the things you have for us here this evening. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so here we go. Uh, verses 14 to 26 <clears throat> hit on the next. <clears throat> this is the next section. Uh, remember I kind of told you how um, we're going to see really 12, uh, you know, applicable brief teachings through the rest of this book. When you get into James 2 through 5, uh, we're going to see these 12 teachings. Uh, and the first one we already reviewed was <clears throat> from last week, the first 13 verses there on partiality, right, or on favoritism. Which, if you look, he wraps it up with this little one-liner at the end of verse 13 that says, Mercy triumphs over judgment. <clears throat> okay, so you're going to see uh, he's, he's quick-witted. He's got these little one-liners that seem to be pretty cool and, and kind of this thread of going through these teachings uh, that I've seen thus far. It's pretty cool. So now we're going to see a new teaching here uh, on what genuine faith looks like. Okay, so that's our header for tonight. Genuine faith, that's what we're talking about. He gets right to the heart of the matter here in verse 14. Because essentially he's asking the question here, you guys, what kind of faith is saving faith? Right? What kind of faith is... Uh, we could say true faith, right? Real faith. Uh, true faith is only faith that saves, which is only faith in Jesus Christ, uh, right? As, as Lord and Savior, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, it, do people have faith in other things? Yeah, right? We have faith in all kinds of things. Uh, you have faith right now that that seat you're sitting in is going to hold the weight and not drop your butt right to the ground, right? Uh, but we certainly know that there are people and across this broad spectrum, you know, of, of religious, you know, beliefs and, and systems. And, and so they would have faith in, in what they believe in. And maybe it's the Quran or maybe it's, uh, you know, the sacraments uh, of the Catholic Church or whatever it is. Um, you know, you can go right down the line and say even um, agnostics and atheists, right? I mean, they have to have faith in something. You, you believe in the Big Bang, you believe in evolution, like you have faith in these things and you're believing those things. Okay, so what is, uh, you know, this genuine faith? What, what is this? What kind of faith is the saving faith? Okay, and he's going to give us an illustration, kind of like last week, right? We just talked about the illustration of the rich man and the poor man. He gives kind of a picture of this. Well, here's our illustration for this week, verse 15 and 16. It says, if a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm, and filled, without giving them the things they need for the body, what good is that? Okay, so go in peace, be warm, and then you do nothing to address their immediate situation, right? Their immediate need. There's a need here that you see, and yet you do nothing about it. You say, oh, I'll pray for you, brother, you know, as you kind of pass by, um, you know, maybe maybe you have something that can be helpful to them, and uh, and you don't act upon that, and that's certainly going to be a weighty thought in this discussion. You know, the actions, right? Um, we we've heard certainly many times uh, actions speak louder than words, right? Excuse me. And so, the acting upon these things, not just using lip service, right? Not just saying something. Uh, anyone can say something. Uh, nice and kind and say, yeah, I'll pray for you in that. Uh, I find myself even saying, you ever find yourself saying, like, telling somebody, yeah, I'm going to pray for you, and then you totally forget to pray for them. It's just like something that you say. Um, so as they're passing here, they're not, they're not helping. They're not, they're not meeting any kind of uh, need that this person may have. 
Okay, so right here, uh, James introduces us to the importance of uh, what, what primarily we probably think about as we got into this, this study. Uh, and I remember I asked a question on week one, and that was probably the, the biggest answer was uh, the thoughts of James or what do you know about the book of James. And it's this relationship between faith and works. Uh, that's generally what most people think about when they think of the book of James. Okay, So this was a big deal. When you think about context, faith and works, tradition, ritual, right? This was a big deal in the early church because... As we talked about, James was a pillar in the early church to who? The Jews or the Gentiles, primarily? To the Jews, okay? Um, along with Peter and others who were primarily to the Jews, and certainly to the Gentiles as well, but we know that Paul's mission was to go primarily to the Gentiles, as the Lord was making that shift and that transition there from the Jew to the, to the Gentile. Uh, but this was a big deal in this time. Um, so the context is, remember these Jews who are coming out of the Old Testament system, right? And the tradition of the, the, the uh, elders, right? The traditions that the, that the nation of Israel had and of all the sacrificial systems and all those things. And a strict adherence to the law, right? They're all about the law, the law of Moses, the law of Moses, circumcision. All the things that were in the law is, is what it was all about to the Jew, Correct. So you understand the issues, we talked about this through some of Paul's letters, you can understand the issue that Paul's having even when he's talking to a group and, and he's talking to a church who has Gentiles and Jews and he's saying to the Gentiles, hey, you got to understand what the Jews are dealing with and with the Jews, hey, you got to understand what the Gentiles are not dealing with. The Gentiles don't have all the baggage that the Jews have of this Old Testament stuff. Are you with me? The Jews have the baggage of this and so they have this strict adherence to the law and all the things that, that come along with the Old Testament system. So they would generally focus on those things rather than on the heart change that's taken place. Uh, does it mean that the, the heart change hadn't happened to them? No, certainly. But, but if you can understand the picture I'm trying to paint that maybe I'm not articulating well, think of your whole life you're doing it this way, and this is how it's been taught to you. You've been trained in it. And now it's changed and it's not really changed but it's been revealed right i guess would be a better a better word to use because now it's being revealed to you that hey all the things that we did and that our forefathers did it was all just imagery pointing to the messiah pointing to jesus he is the sacrifice so we no longer have to sacrifice he is our high priest we no longer need a high priest he is this. He is this. We are the temple of God. We no longer need a temple to go to worship and meet with God. All, all the things. You see all the stuff they have to unpack, right? So they've got a lot, of, a lot of baggage that comes along with them. And so you can understand that this would be a significant problem uh, for, for them, okay, and, and dealing with this and sorting through this stuff. But as we say that, we also know that the New Testament clearly teaches salvation is or justification is not by works correct i think we're all in this room on the same page with that uh that justification is by faith uh not by works okay that, that we believe and we teach that the scriptures teach uh that salvation is by grace alone right <clears throat> through faith alone and christ alone okay so uh <clears throat> some of the things Adam gave you guys, some of those bookmarks with the sola, you know, the five solas on it and stuff. And so that's certainly what we believe, right? Grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone. Uh, there's three of your solas right there. Okay, so let's look at a couple of these scriptures uh, just for, just because it's good for us to remind ourselves always of what the scriptures say. Uh, but let's flip over to Romans chapter 3. Who's got that? Can read it for us. <coughs> Romans three twenty eight. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Seems pretty simple, right? Seems pretty clear. That's not like uh, you know dark sayings or parables or anything. Okay, one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Uh, let's go to Galatians. 
Galatians 2.16. Somebody else can get that one? Galatians 2.16. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and, and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. That seems pretty clear. Yeah? <clears throat> okay. And both of these are... Who wrote Romans? Paul. Who wrote Galatians? Paul. Paul. Okay. So, but who wrote Titus? <laughs> Titus. <laughs> nice job. I got them all for a second going, is this a trick question? Yeah, good. So let's see what he says again. Let's get the third one here. And certainly we can go to Romans uh, 5. We can go to many other places, you guys, to, to certainly see this principle in the scriptures. <clears throat> These are just three that I... Um, you know, looked at and studying just to say these three are pretty, pretty obvious and pretty clear. Titus three eight. <clears throat> Can somebody get that? The saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. Yeah, that's not the one I'm looking for. No. Great verse. Good job. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it is 3-8. I must have wrote something wrong there. I'm not going to spend too much time looking for it. We'll go with the other two. Um, the idea is, and the principle here is, that uh, clearly Paul is stating and teaching in the New Testament that salvation or, or justification, understand what that means, right? Justification, what does that mean? What is Justification. Are being justified. Being saved. Okay, being <clears throat> saved, certainly, right? So it certainly is having to deal with salvation, uh, and certainly that is the ultimate answer, that yes, it's being saved. Uh, so what does it mean to be justified? To be, to be, to be found right. Okay, good. Good, to be found right. Um, remember we even talked about how uh, we must be righteous. Okay, so justified. If you remember it, um, I remember when I was a young believer and just thinking uh, the pastor was so witty as he said, uh, justified means just as if I'd never sinned. So that's what justified means. Um, it's, you know, remember that, that the scriptures tell us that we are declared righteous by God if we are in Christ. Because we are not righteous, right? There's no righteousness in us. <laughs> uh, but in that, uh, in that great switch, <clears throat> excuse me, and, um, you know, that, that Jesus died on the cross, he paid for our sins, right? And it says that's the imp imputation, which we're going to talk about here, that uh, when he gets to the, the conversation to the example of Abraham, it says that Abraham believed God. And it was counted, or it was reckoned, or it was imputed. That means accredited to your account. <clears throat> so a few things happen there. But in, in the imputation or the crediting of your account, when Jesus went to the cross, our sin was credited to him. Right? He paid for the sins of all who would believe in him. So our sin was credited to him. And his righteousness is then credited to us. You see it? So... That's what it means to be declared righteous. You're declared righteous <clears throat> because of Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.21 uh, He made him to become sin who knew no sin that we might become the righteousness of God. Okay, so when he took on our sin, he, he has declared us righteous. And so God sees us as righteous because he sees Christ Jesus in us. Okay, so justification, all this to say... Justification, salvation, it is certainly by faith and not by works. Uh, think of Ephesians 2, 8, 9, right? That uh, it is by grace, right? It is by faith that you are saved. Uh, it is a gift of God, not of yourselves, right? It is a gift is what it says. It is by God's grace that we are saved. Yes, sir? I don't think you're looking for 3, 5. Thank he you. saved us not on the basis of things which we have done in righteousness. Thank you. <clears throat> Good. That sounds correct. 
Yeah, thank you. I thank knew you. I'd do what you Yeah, had to be there somewhere. <laughs> thank you, sir. So, when we go back now to James, let's get back to our text. We see <clears throat> this is what James is teaching here. Okay, it's certainly going to sound as we move forward like he is standing on, on works being a part of it. But, you know, we have to see the, the big picture, and we will see it as we continue to unpack it. Uh, that James is in harmony, excuse me, with, with Paul's teachings here in regards to justification by faith. And again, we should understand that it makes sense that both these men teach what they were taught, right? Because who were they taught by? By the Lord himself, right? So, guess where we need to go? Let's go see what the Lord said. Let's go to Matthew chapter 7. And it seems like every week we're going back here. Remember I told you so many parallels with, with what do we call this? Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. What do, what do we refer, refer to that as? Sermon on the Mount. Good, Sermon on the Mount. Okay, so back to the Sermon on the Mount. We've got Matthew 7. If someone will read uh, 21 to 27. Jay, I know you've got this memorized. You could read it first. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Uh, keep going to 27. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. And it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Okay. So you see a couple things in here, right? A couple parallels here, even, even to last week, as it talks about those who hear these words of mine and do not do them, right? Well, who are the ones that hear the words and do them? The believers, right? Not the ones who, who do not do them, which are the ones who are saying, didn't we do this in your name? Didn't I do this for you? I, did, I said I did this for you, and that's why I was doing it. And he says, no, nope, never knew you. Uh, you weren't doing it for me. So being a doer of the word and and having to have this faith is certainly the key to it it's not by the deeds that they did right did jesus said oh yeah you did all these great things and wonderful things come on in no that's not the that's not what saves you it's not the good works that they had done that, that did it it's the faith that they have in him and he's saying yeah you didn't have that uh i, I didn't know you you're you're not one of my sheep right you don't you don't get to come in uh, so it's not by the works that we do that we are justified. It is, again, solely by faith alone and by God's grace alone. Good to see you, brother. Okay, so let's get back to the text. Let's go back to James 2. And I want you to note here and notice here that James does not say if someone has faith, right? Look in verse 14. It says, what good is my brothers if someone says he has faith. You see it? There's a difference there. He's not saying if someone has faith and moving on into these things. He says if someone says they have faith. So now what are we talking about? We're talking about a profession of faith. Which isn't that just what the, the people said to Jesus? Jesus says many, many people in that day are going to profess that they had faith, but they don't. Okay, again, the wheat, the tares, the saints and the ants, again, the two groups. So he's speaking of someone here that is, is just making a mere profession of faith. And you see the parallel here now as he unpacks this and says, as you say to your brother or sister in need, go in peace. Well, get, what is that? You're just saying to them, yeah, do well. You're, you're giving them these words, and it's just a profession of sympathy 
or feeling for, for their need. Just as the person may say, oh yeah, I have faith. It's empty. Do you see his point? Do you see the parallel? You say to this person who's out here and needs, needs a coat and a jacket and some socks and shoes, oh, be well, and you just kind of go along your way. Same thing. You didn't do anything. There's no action attached to that that shows you actually care for this person, right? Same thing that he's saying about someone who says, yeah, oh, I have all the faith. I believe in God. I believe in Jesus and believe those things. And there's no action attached to it. It's empty. There's nothing. You see it? And that's, that's what he's unpacking here. That, and that's what we're going to go over in, certainly in the next few verses as we move forward. But any thoughts on uh, these few, at least through these first couple verses with this uh, picture of the brother and sister and the emptiness here? I mean, I get what he's saying, and it's true, but at the same time, a lot of times you score a lot more points by saying no. And I say no to people all the time. I want this, I want that. I say no, and I beat the crap out of them when I say no. And that's what helps them. Not by handing them some food or handing them a sweater. Telling them no. So it's, there's a lot of ways to look at things, Craig. Sure. And I get what he's saying, and it is, that is true, action and with faith. Sure. But a lot of times, that, that is the action. The action is, get a job, you know? And that's what Which, a lot of people need to hear. And so now we have... Especially at this church. Now we can bring in a whole lot of other things yeah, with, yeah. with yeah. that. Because the, the principle that you're talking about, I certainly understand. Yeah, if we want to call it the, tough love. Whatever you uh, want to call but, it, it works. But we clearly understand, though, the heart that we're supposed to have for people. Now, does that mean that you have to give money to everyone that holds a can walking out on the street? Absolutely. Does that mean that if you've already done this for this guy five times, mm. do you do it a sixth time and a seventh time? Uh, now, that's those are total different stories, right, of, in our sanctification process and, and how you may feel uh, somebody, you know, Pete may give the guy five bucks every single time he sees him, uh, whereas I gave him five bucks one time and I'm never going to give him money again. Uh, but that's certainly... I understand your being. I'm just your, saying your there thought. is an action in not an inaction. Sure. By saying no, you're not getting this way. But the so heart of what James is talking about love. is to give this analogy to show that there must be something attached to the faith. Because that is the outward appearance of the evidence, and that's what we're going to get into here, unpacking it as we move the next couple verses. That's what shows uh, you know your faith. Yes, so you have somebody who says, professes, I am a Christian, but then when you look at their life, they don't have the works of a Christian. Good. But it, it, it's also the, the, the works being the fruit. So it, it, the, the part of what he's also saying is that to say, yeah, yeah, be blessed and God freeze your butt off. Right. It, it, Part of the fruit would actually be, hey, listen, I know where we can get you right. some clothes. It might be I've got us done for the clothes to give to you, but right. it's still that you can help. Right. By, you know. That's right. And and that's that's the point, you know, just going to the next slide. You guys both said it well right there. I mean, that's the point. He's saying, he's saying, can such a faith save you? You know, is this a saving faith, this, this picture he's giving to them? Uh, would this be a, a, a real true faith here? Um, this, this faith that you say that you have and this profession that you make, um, because is it fruitful, you know, to your point? I mean, that's, God does look at the heart. We've already talked about that a couple of times. We're not able to see the heart, right? I'm not able to see the heart and the intentions of any of you or anyone else, especially if someone maybe like this, for instance, that I just met or I'm just walking across. I don't know anything about this person who's cold and, and naked on the street. But I do know that what, Pete said is is very accurate. I know what the Bible says and how the Lord says to act upon that person. And, and and also we could flip the switch and say, look, aren't there, do you think that there are unbelievers in the world who would see that person and go get them some clothes and clothe them? Yes. Yeah, there are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So again, here's the other side of the coin of showing the works don't save you. Uh, the works don't mean that you're saved. If I were to see someone, help someone like that, I would think, great, you know, being compassionate and, and doing that. And would I think that maybe they are a believer? I would tend to think in my humanity that, hey, maybe this guy is a believer because believers are to respond in love in that way. 
uh, but it certainly doesn't mean that they are, right? But that action and that good work that he would do in this in his picture doesn't save him and, and doesn't make him saved, okay? But James is saying, if you are saved and you don't do anything for that guy, pff, I don't know that you're saved, you know? So the fruit is a big deal for us because, again, go back to the heart. We can't see the heart. What can we see? Fruit. We can see evidence. Um, that's not why we do it, right? I, I don't try to obey God and live a Christian life so that you guys can all see my fruit, you know what I mean, to brag about or whatever. That's not what we do. But it is something we should see in, in changed lives. There, there should be fruit, uh, and that's clear. I mean, when we go back to Matthew 13 again, and the parable of the seeds, and remember the seeds fall on four grounds, and one ground to, is the good soil that takes the seed and grows it into a tree, it says, that produces fruit. And, and, and Jesus says, any tree that does not produce good fruit will be cast into the fire. Pretty clear, right? There is to be fruit. But like anything, evidence can be circumstantial. The non-believer giving the blanket to the guy, yep. which the world says, oh, that's a good thing. Yeah. That may be an act of evil to foster dependence, just like the government said. Yeah, oh, I'll enough. give you this, and you'll be fine. You get to eat. Sure. We'll just yeah. take your whole so life So now you've got to the intent. So, it's, you know, so now you're getting to the intent, and, yeah. which, which is a big deal then, because that's exactly right. What is our intent? Because to if be? your heart is good, the intent to say, no, get a job, that's love. To say, oh, here, here, get through another week, and here's some more crap. Sure. That isn't helping them well, sometimes. Well, so you yeah, have to, well, you're talking God about only enabling. knows. We don't know. Right. You might say, oh, he's great. He just gave a bunch of food and clothes to sure. this guy. It's because he hates them, and he wants to keep them down. Maybe. Like a government. And so remember, government. so remember, Dan, I can't see the intent Come of on. your heart or of my uh, of other people's hearts. God I, can, I can barely sometimes deal with the intent of my own heart. <laughs> so the, the, the heart is what it is and like i said the intent well, certainly the intent of other people may be evil but our intent is supposed to come out of a faith that he's talking about right, right. and so then it should be god real see the it should be real compassion heart, so it shouldn't be just a profession what man thinks because man is dumb yep. man is stupid it, yeah god and, knows and that's okay man. but man believers we are able to also judge by your fruit as we talked about, we are to judge believers and brothers, and we can see the lack of fruit or the evidence of fruit. Sometimes. Uh, and so that's a... Uh, not as much as you would think. Uh, that's long time. Yeah, not to kind of belabor this point anymore, but, I mean, looking at verses 14 through 17 and the, the, the analogy that he's using about giving, uh, or about telling someone, uh, seeing someone in need and telling them to go, um, I, I don't know that he's necessarily equating your helping them as you have as evidence of your faith right I think he I think he, it's it's just an analogy if yes you if you're saying if you tell them to go in peace and don't do anything for them you're not you're not doing the action that's right that's, that's right. all he's that's all he's getting yes. at is if and we kind of action along with the that's faith, right we're kind of going down a little rabbit that. trail there of right. the good the bad and the ugly which is fine because it can come into part of this conversation but the overall arching principle is exactly that. That's what we're talking about. The action that should be evidence of true faith. Right. That's right. That action is the fruit. Which, that's right. That's right. Which, again, is just like last week uh, uh, when he gave another analogy of the rich man porn. Right? It wasn't to go down the, the path of, of you're helping this guy or hurting this guy. It's the intent of the underlying principle, which is exactly what you said. I think, too, is anybody can give anybody food. And not that giving somebody food or money is a bad thing. It's not. But any organization, anybody, anywhere can yeah. give anybody something. Sure. For the good. Many like, secular not be, do. But the one thing that Christians can give that nobody else can is the gospel. That's right. And if you start with that gift, then other things can come out of it. Yeah. And I think, that's, I think that's where James' heart is going. It's yep. more than just looking at somebody and saying, be well. It's, here's the gospel. This is salvation. And then let's get into the, what you need. How can I help you in those sorts of sure. things? Sure. Because that's the greatest gift, is to make them a believer. Indeed. If the Lord wills. That's exactly, exactly right. But we are to be doing the things that show the evidence of our faith. 
right, and not just empty professions, which is what he's talking about. Um, so, and that's what he says when he goes into verse 17 now, you know, he answers this question that he's asking, you know, does this faith save anyone? You know, this profession you're saying, and you don't do anything, does that save you? And he says in verse 17, uh, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So, uh, if it has no works, then it's dead being by itself, is what the, uh, is what the NASB says. So, faith like that, he's saying, is dead. So, then faith, when it's alive, produces works. Right? That's, that's the essence of this. That where there is no existence of works produced by your said faith, that's actually proof that your faith is non-existent, right? If you actually have faith, there will be evidence of your faith because there will be these uh, works and deeds that are manifested naturally. It's a natural byproduct of being a believer to love your neighbor, to do the things you just talked about. Uh, those are natural things that happen in, in people's lives who have been changed by Christ. It's a paradox, I mean, it's going like, a, you know, it's sort of, <laughs> you know, it's kind of weird, you know. <laughs> yeah. Because it's all true, it's all true, like, say, by not helping him, you're helping him, and by helping him, you're helping him, and by, right. you know, it's kind of crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah sure. absolutely. That's yeah, the yeah. thing, yeah, yeah. the world yeah. hell's paid with good intentions. People yeah. don't always realize they're not helping sometimes. Right. Think so. yeah. Or vice versa. Well, well that's about the whole part of it. Yeah. You can do that too much and not enough. It's, oh, yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah, and that's what I mean. And, that and that's, that's what I'm saying, question. what Matt's saying. We can certainly get in a whole conversation sidebar about enabling and all those other yeah. things. But that's not the intent of the teaching here. That's not that's not what we're talking about. Certainly it's it's a sidebar from that for sure. Uh, but you know, the, the attitudes, the intentions, the, the workings, the things that you're doing um, should be evidence of coming out of that faith. Or if you're not having that, um, then it certainly is a lack of evidence that there is faith existing. Right? That there's a saving faith existing there. Okay? Uh, 18. Someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. I've always liked that one. I mean, I think that's pretty much summing up what we're talking about right now. Um, you know, that's the key here. This word show here, right? Show me your faith, right? Show me the money. <laughs> show me the faith. This, excuse me, is saying, look, give evidence. Let's see this on exhibit. Let, let's see it. This, the show me means it, it, expose it to me, show it to me, let me see, um, in fact, the evidence of what you're saying. So, James is not questioning or contradicting here how we are justified. Okay? Uh, it can certainly seem that way um, to some when we get forward the next couple verses. We'll see that a little bit more, too. But... Um, He's speaking to, um, you know, the demonstration of our faith, right? We keep talking about the evidence. Um, the demonstration of our faith or the evidence of our faith is what should be connected to it, right? This should be a connected thing. It shouldn't be separate. Um, like he's saying, someone will say to you, well, you have faith and I have works. That they're two separate things. I do this and you do that, um, which certainly is the case with the person who's saying that because they don't have faith, right? You, you see it? So, but if you have the faith, it's not that you don't have the works. You, you should have the both, right? If you have the faith, the other one should be connected and should be there. There's, there's not this disconnect um, that he's talking about. Because look over verse 24 even uh, before we get there. But that's where it gets a little confusing, and you, you can see why Pete, some people had issue with, with the book of James when it was being canonized, and I told you about Martin Luther's issues, but look at verse 24. He says, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. If you just pick that verse out, right? If, if we're proof texting and I just said, this is our verse for tonight. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And I close the book. 
Now I could say anything I want. Just say, like, see what it says? People are justified by works, not faith alone. See it? That's what it says, right? That's what it says. But we'll get back into that in a minute. When you harmonize with the rest of scriptures, that's why we went to Paul's scriptures and looked at it. And when you look at the intent of what James is saying here, that's not what he's saying. He's saying that it's connected, okay? That it's, it's not only by faith alone, but it is by these works because the works are proof of the faith that has justified you. It's connected. There's definitely not a disconnect. He's saying there will be this connection here. And that's why he's going to give Abraham as an example here because he's certainly a great example to go to. Okay, in the Old Testament. And remember, again, that his, you know, his teachings and his audiences are primarily Jewish. But, um, you know, when we get to Abraham over here, we're going to see that for sure. Okay. He continues next. Where are we at? Verse 20. Verse 19. You believe that God is one, and you say you have faith, and you believe this. He says, you do well. For the demons believe, and they shudder, right? Or they tremble, is what the King James Version says. So you believe in the existence of God, and look, there's many, many people out there in the world that will say they believe in a God, and that they believe in the God even of the Bible. Uh, good for you, James says, but so do the demons, right? So does Satan and, and all the wicked um, followers of Satan, the fallen <laughs> angels. Uh, are, look, is Satan and, and the angels, the demons, are they being saved? No. <laughs> no. Do, do they have saving faith? Nope, they don't. Intellectual knowledge is not saving faith, right? Having a knowledge of something is not having faith. There's many people, secular minds and secular, you know, men who the world would say are very wise and a lot smarter than me. But we understand Corinthians tells us the opposite because true wisdom only comes from the Lord, right? Remember that? So, but there's many out there who are secular and non-believers who know the Bible better than I do. And they try to rip it to shreds, and they want to debate you, and they want to talk to you about it, and all those things. They have a knowledge of what the Bible says, but you understand there's a total disconnect. They have no true knowledge of it because they don't believe it, because they don't have saving faith. They don't have true faith. They haven't been regenerated or born again, so they cannot truly understand what it says. I have a friend like that. Yeah, he read all the different yep. books and the extra books that aren't part yep. of the Bible. Quizzes me on a lot of stuff that I don't know anything about. And, you know, it's hard for me to converse with him because he obviously knows, knows so, much. so much more about yeah. it. But he has no faith whatsoever, and, and it, it's disheartening. It really is. I've known so many people like that. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I've known many, many people like that. Yeah, so I, I hope you understand the point of what I'm, I'm saying here, that uh, of James is saying here, and I'm packing here, the demons believe, right? And they tremble because they know God. Uh, they certainly know God. They were there when he created them, right? God created Satan. Satan knows God. The demons know God face-to-face, person-to-person. They're, they're well aware who Jesus is and that he's uh, God. And so they know what's happened. They know what the end is. They know what's going to happen to them one day. That's why they tremble. So that's not a saving faith. Right? We must have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? This is about the thing that you've always spoke about, though, about context. It's so easy to take all this out of context because it's so really on a thin line. Of, That's right. You know, if you just said one of these things randomly, it would be totally wrong. That's right. But if you look at it in its in context for the rest, it's different. That's right. And I would challenge someone then also, you know, to go and find... Okay, take verse 24 there. Now go find all the supporting scriptures and get back to me that, that show that verse 24 is true. Because I'll bring a mountain of evidence that show you that's not what he's saying because the rest of the scriptures don't teach us that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, That's right. Yep. And that is apologetics. That is context, context, context. That's right. Good. Okay, so now look at verse 20. James now gives a strong rebuke here. Right? Look at this. He says, uh, you foolish person, or you foolish fellow. Uh, so who is he talking to here? He's talking to the one who says he has faith. Remember, he, one that says, someone that says they have faith and makes this profession <coughs> that he sees as false. He says to them, uh, you foolish person, um, which is right on target. Right? Because 
we know that anyone who is of the world is a fool because they do not know and understand spiritual things. Because remember, true wisdom only comes from God, right? Proverbs talks about uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Psalm says that as well. So Paul told us that in 1 Corinthians when we went through that study. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> that wisdom of the world is foolishness. Although they think we're the fools, right? They think that we're foolish. But we are the true wise ones. So James calls them to recognize that this faith without works is useless, right? Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith without works is useless? And that's what he's saying. With, without, without the connection of the actions here and the connection of what? The fruit, then you don't have a healthy truth. You don't have a true faith if you don't have these things being manifested in evidence. All right, let's get into Abraham. <clears throat> so we got verse 21 to 23. Um, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active long, along with his works. See it? Connection. And faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. How awesome is that? All who believe are friends of God. Okay? Everyone who's a believer is not only a friend of God, but a child of God. So, his point here is that, follow me. It's Genesis chapter 22 when uh, God tells Abraham to go offer up his son. In fact, he says, your only son, even though he had another son. So he says, offer up your only son uh, and take him up on the mountain there and, and make him as an offering. Uh, and so that is the evidence or the work here that James is talking about, okay, in Genesis 22. And it certainly is evidence of his faith being perfected because we know it was being perfected because what was Genesis chapter 22? It was God testing Abraham's faith yeah. that he already had because we know, uh, let's turn to Genesis chapter 15. Let's go to Genesis 15. That's where uh, James is quoting from here when he says, Abraham believed God. Okay, let's go to Genesis 15. And look at verse 6. Chapter 12, God calls Abram. Now in chapter 15, he makes a covenant with Abram, makes a promise to him. And look at verse 16, look at verse 6, excuse me. It says here, he believed, or Abraham believed the Lord, and he, God, the Lord, counted it to him, Abram, as righteousness. What does that mean? That means he believed the promise of God of Genesis 3.15, the promise of the Messiah to come. And Abram believed that, and in believing that, it was reckoned or accounted or imputed to him as righteousness, just like it is to you or I. How are you declared righteous? Only by faith in Jesus Christ. Did Abram know that the Messiah's name would be Jesus Christ? Well, Christ means Messiah, same thing. So certainly maybe he doesn't know the name, right? Anyone before Jesus? But they knew the promise was what? The promised one. That's what Messiah means, the anointed one, the promised one. That's what Christ means. They were looking for the Messiah, looking for the Christ, and they believed that God would send him. Do you see it? It's still by faith that God imputed righteousness to, to them. So Abraham had this faith in chapter 15, and he was tested greatly in chapter 22. And in his obedience, James is saying that is the work that is the evidence of his faith. He did that and was willing and to sacrifice his own son because of his faith in God. Uh, you can write these down for the sake of time. We're not going to go to all of them. Romans 4.3 and Galatians 3.6 uh, directly correspond or parallel this, this uh, passage that James is talking about, where he says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Paul says it in both those two places, the same exact thing to show that it is by faith and not by works. I do want to turn to these. I'm going to turn to this one because I'm already there. 
Let me read Second Chronicles for you real quick. I'm almost there. Second Chronicles 20, verse 7. says, if I can find the seven, Did you not, our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? That's where he's talking about, it says that he's a friend of God. Okay, And Jesus later talks about uh, all those who believe, believers are called friends of God. But I do want you to look at Hebrews. If you're in James, it's only back a couple pages. Go back to Hebrews 11. Bugulous chapter, Hebrews 11. What's that all about? Hall of Faith. Good, Hall of Faith. Okay, Hebrews 11. Look at verse 8. It says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place. That's talking about chapter 12, when, when God called him to leave where he is and just go where I tell you. So he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. You see that? He by faith went, and he by faith went to, uh, to, to, to follow God, to obey God. Look at verse 17. So that's chapter 12. That's the first step. Now we move forward into chapter 15. Look at verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was what? tested, Genesis chapter 22, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. What does that mean? That means Abraham knew full well that God told him, through your son Isaac, I'm going to build you a multitude of people, and a multitude of my people, through your son Isaac. So now, Isaac's like a lad, it says, like 13, 14 teenager. He has no kids. He takes him up on the mountain because God tells him, go kill this kid. And he's saying, dude, if I kill this kid, your promises aren't true. And there is no, <laughs> there is no multitude. Do you see it? It's saying he had so much faith, he was going to kill the kid. I'm going to kill my son because I know that God's promises are true. And if God told me through this son the multitude will be had, then he will certainly raise this kid from dead after I kill him. <laughs> are you kidding me? That's faith. <laughs> That's faith right there. That's what God's word said was going through Abram's head when he was taking the the sticks for burning and the knife for the sacrifice, and his son says to him, I see all the stuff, Daddy, but where's the sacrifice? <laughs> Are you kidding me? And that's the faith that Abraham had. The word tells us this is what he was doing and thinking. That's faith. So you see, the point is, Abraham was justified, just as James says, by faith. <clears throat> but the work, the fruit, the evidence was visible of Abraham's saving faith, just as it should be, right, with, with you and me. Okay, verse 24. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. So, we got into that a little bit, but again, he is stating that faith separated from these works is not a saving faith. That where there is true faith, there will, in fact, be works and good works. Aren't we called to spur one another on and to good deeds, right? Aren't we called to do the good things and the good commands? Jesus says, if you love me, obey my commands and keep my commandments. So, again, this, this is a thing that he was battling. It seems like Paul was battling that a lot, this antinomianism. Anybody know what that means? That's just a fancy word. Antinomianism means anti-law. It means against the law. So... A lot of people back in that time, and certainly still today, were so antinomianism, or so anti-law, against the law, they would say, well, the law doesn't even matter, right? And this is what Paul says, well, you could say the law doesn't matter, so I could just do whatever I want, right? I'm saved by grace, by the Lord Jesus Christ, 
So the law is no good. I don't need to follow the law, right? And what does Paul say to that? <laughs> Indeed, no way. He says emphatically, no, that is not the case. Because you've been saved, you've been changed, and you now want to obey God's laws and God's rules because that is the way you're supposed to live your life. So it's not the other way around. So he, he was, in fact, he would rebuke those who were living that way and say, no, that's, that's totally wrong. You, you can't do that. That's, that's not how we're supposed to be living. So that is some of the struggle <clears throat> that James is dealing with, again, with these Jews. And that's why he's unpacking this so much to say it's about the faith. It's about the faith. It's about the faith. It's about the faith. But these <clears throat> works will, again, be evident. Okay, so now we got a couple minutes. I'm going to go a couple minutes over, but you guys bear with me. Rahab, now we see the next example. Okay, in our last two verses. In the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? What's that talking about? Somebody give us a close notes version. That's Joshua 2. You can write that down. Anybody know? What, what are we talking about? Who are we talking about? Who's this Rahab prostitute lady? She wasn't in the, uh, in, in the back door of Jericho. So that was good. good. God told Joshua, right, this was the conquest. They were going in. They were taking over the lands that they were promised. And Joshua is now the leader after Moses has died. And they are told to go and, and destroy Jericho. And they're told to march around the city and, and blow these trumpets and that the walls of the city are going to fall so they don't have to battle. God's going to take care of it. They just have to obey. And what happens? Two spies go, right, to look at the land. And they are, people are, are caught them and they're going to chase them. And Rahab lives there on the wall and hides the two messengers from Israel and helps them. So then she says, hey, when you guys come back to destroy this city, I know your God is going to give you this. So she believed what God was going to do, and she helped save and protect these two messengers from God's people, and she was promised for doing that, that her and her family would be spared. So when they came back and they, they did their thing and the walls of Jericho fell down and were destroyed, Rahab and her family were saved. And remember what they, she had to do? She had to put the scarlet thread out the window to let them know this was the window, this is her room, this is their house, and where they are. And so that scarlet thread, I always love that because that's a, a picture. You know, that's a picture to me of the scarlet thread of Jesus Christ that runs all through the Bible. That's what that scarlet thread is all about. Um, so the point being, she believed God, she protected his messengers, and she was saved by, by her faith, okay, in God. And she, in fact, becomes uh, instrumental in a huge way because just how crazy awesome the Bible is, if you go to um, Matthew chapter 1, you're going to read the lineage of Christ, and you're going to see a woman in there named Rahab, a prostitute, a harlot from this city they destroyed, because she was then, her, her and her family then went and lived with the people of Israel. She married a man named Solomon, and they had a child named Boaz, who married a woman named Ruth, and then went down a couple lines. You have Obed, Jesse, then King David, whose, whose line leads all the way down to Jesus. This Rahab prostitute is in the line of Jesus, and she's right in Matthew 1. She, in fact, is in Hebrews 11 in the Hall of Faith, one of the few women labeled in there, listed in there, because of her faith. So he's using her as an example now. Abraham, big, yeah, awesome. Woo, we love Abraham, all the Jews, right? But now he uses Rahab. The harlot says, look. She was justified by faith just the same way. And her works were, just like Abraham had his work, she was tested and her works were. She helped the messengers of God and she was instrumental in God's plan. Same thing, that there will be evidence of these things. Okay, so we'll close. We'll have a couple minutes of comments. He closes with 26, uh, again with a one-liner, summing up our whole evening here that says, uh, faith without works is dead. That's kind of definitely one of the main catchphrases of James that probably most of us will remember. So what do you guys got? Thoughts, comments, inputs? I went crazy Craig speed at the end there to get through it all, so thank you for bearing with me. Thank you for bearing with me. Paul said the same thing about faith and words at some point. 
Oh, certainly. Yeah, that it should be evidence. Yeah. Yep. What else? Everybody's quiet. I know it's 9.03. Promise you won't melt. You'll be okay. There you go, James. Oh, hey. Check that out. I didn't think it would come up. Well, it went when I was sharing the screen. Hey, look at that. There's you guys. We got you guys on the big screen. Everybody can see you now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. now that you know we can all see you, it might change the way you dress up every week. <laughs> Just kidding. Just don't stand up, Don. We know you're, you're wearing, like, boxer shorts or something. You seen those commercials? It's so funny. Yeah. Uh, what else, guys? <clears throat> hey. Confusing? You know, it's like, oh, this is, this is a tough thought, tough teaching, and certainly, like we said, if you take and misconstrue some of the, the plot line, if you will, the context here, then, yeah, it can, be, it can be misconstrued into saying something totally different. But us knowing, as well as we do, the Word of God, uh, we understand that this isn't, in fact, contradicting what, Jane, what Paul or anyone else says. It's, he's unpacking it in a more <coughs> applicable way. He's unpacking it a little deeper in, in a way to say to these people and to say to us, check yourself, right? Paul certainly talks about examine yourself, right? Examine yourself, um, you know, also to, to examine yourself to know that you are in the faith, right? How, how do you know that you're in the faith? How do you examine yourself to know that you're in the faith? I think it has to do with his audience as well. It's, it's much more directed because of the Definitely. Church he's talking to. Yeah. Definitely. Because they come out of that world of works where the Gentiles are not. Yep, for sure. Good. All right, anything else? You got this. Got, you guys got this down. This is too easy. All right. All right, well, let's close it down. Jay, would you pray for us, brother? Sure. Thank you. Heavenly Father, thank you for this church. Thank you for this study. Thank you for yeah. Pastor Craig. Please help our unbelief, Lord. Mm -hmm. Increase our faith. Transform, renew our minds, Lord. Help us to take what we have learned and to apply this in the world, Lord, in our jobs, in our homes, in our families. And, Lord, uh, help us, Lord, not only to come to Bible study, and just listen and read, but help us to also live this life yep. accordingly, Lord, as, as you'd have us. Um, please have everyone get home safely in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, brother.